Hi, I'm Stacey and welcome back to my YouTube channel. So I'm going to show you how to do a quick demo of input and output constraints. The reason why you need these constraints is because the FPGA is driving different signals. So say, for example, you have a clock signal and then you have multiple data signals, like individual bits that make up a bus. And all of those signals are going to take different routes. They're going to take different routes through the FPGA and they're going to take different routes outside the FPGA on the board itself as they travel along the board, along the traces to the next chip. And so you want to make sure that all of those signals stay in sync with each other and they stay in sync with the clock. So when they arrive at the chip that the FPGA is talking to, they all arrive at the same time so that they can all be registered on the clock cycle as they come in. And so it's important to make sure that the differences in signal timing between the different signals and between those signals relative to the clock are all accounted for so that when the signals arrive at the destination, they all arrive in line with each other. And that's why we have input and output delay constraints for buses that have a clock and multiple signals, like the Ethernet GMI bus. And that's what these constraints are for. So I'm going to head over to the Ethernet, and we can see that this chip is that guy who I don't recognize. Oh, it's a TI chip. It's not that ubiquitous one. And it's an MII interface. Timing constraints when it comes to input and output delays are complicated and difficult. And so I am going to give you a general rule of thumb that as a beginner, you can probably get away with most of the time. Usually when you do timing constraints, you need to know the trace lengths of how long the traces are on the board. Usually the board designer will do the constraints for the board and supply them with the lengths and everything correct. And so when you have a development board and maybe they don't give you the constraints like the Digilent board, for the most part, you can get away with estimating what those constraints are. And usually what I do is I just make them one nanosecond tighter than they usually would be. And that compensates for the track lengths. So uh, I usually just do one extra nanosecond. If you look at the Ethernet chip transmit and receive timing, and then what Vivado has is it's got this really nice constraint template. So I'm just going to control C that. So this is for the receive, control C, close, control V. TCO max and TCO min are, uh, I or this, it's this distance here, T252. So I'm just going to head over to T252, and it's 10 to 30 nanoseconds. So the max is 30 and the min is 10. So we go max 30, min is 10. And then for the trace delays, I always just put one. And then it's, I'm going to make this Rx, uh, MII, Rx, zero, for example. And then the input clock is MII. Rx clock like that and so what you do is you so you just look at this number for the under receive timing it's the distance from the clock edge to the valid data starting and then you head over to here go to the tools language templates and get the input delay because the received data is an input to the FPGA and you choose system synchronous the first one and then for the output delay, delay, the output is the transmitted data that you're transmitting over Ethernet. You choose that one. So then I'm just going to get this one like that. And then this is going to be TA clock. And then the setup time is 10 and the hold time is zero. Setup is 10, hold is zero, trace delay one delay one uh actually the bin can be zero and this one can also be zero so this is really complicated <laughs> but it is an example of just the demonstration of what you do basically you go and look at the ethernet chip on your board you look at the data sheet you find the mii timing diagram and you look at the setup and hold times for the transmit and the receiving timing as well. So the TX uses the output delay constraint and the RX uses the input delay constraint. And you just look up 
the timing, the transmit timing and receive timing in your Ethernet chip. And for the transmit timing, you use up the setup and hold values. So this T242 and 243 and put it in the constraint in the template. And then for the input delay constraint, you use the receive timing min and max values. And that's basically this value 252. I usually just do one nanosecond of trace length and that allows you to um, have a ballpark figure. It's quite a large value for the trace length. And that way you don't actually have to know the length of the traces in order to do the calculation. And that is it. And it's way more complicated than this, but I just wanted to show you how to do those constraints. I will put the templates in the description. Also a really, really good Altera timing resource that is for the Altera timing constraints that I'll put in the description as well. So I hope that this can be helpful to you. In the next video, I'm gonna be doing interpreting timing reports and stuff like that. So I really appreciate you. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye.